It's interesting, there are more surgeon spouses in the audience for this talk than, uh, <coughs> than for some of the other talks. Ferdinand Sauerbrook was one of the world's greatest surgeons. A brilliant diagnostician and exquisite technician, he attracted to his operating theaters and clinics at the Charité Hospital in Berlin a stream of patients and students from across Europe, Russia, and the United Kingdom. In his late 60s, however, Sauerbrook began to change. Colleagues noted mood swings and periods of forgetfulness. He would strike assistance with instruments during operations, operations which were performed with growing clumsiness, dragging at tissues and tearing at blood vessels. The administration of the Charité Hospital, warmed by the financial flames of his international fame, failed to act. Individual efforts by his colleagues suggesting retirement were met with flat refusal. A prominent actor died of bleeding from a simple herniorophy. A young child succumbed when Sauerbrook failed to restore gastrointestinal continuity during a gastrectomy. Finally, in 1949, at age 74, he retired when faced with the prospect of a humiliating public dismissal. Even then, Sauerbrook had little insight. He continued to operate at his home with disastrous results. His 1953 autobiography is entitled Master Surgeon. Well, 60 years after Sauerbrook's dismissal, is the aging surgeon still a potential problem? Well, there's some published evidence that it is and, uh, and overwhelming anecdotal evidence that it is. Here's a study by Walgie and Associates published a few years ago that showed significantly worse mortality for the older surgeons in some of these big operations. However, if you look deeper, it's really the older surgeons that perform low volumes of these procedures. And so Walgie concluded that surgeon age was a relatively weak predictor and that certainly it was much worse in discriminating performance among individual surgeons. But it's really those individual surgeons that we're talking about. This, I'm not going to read this, but I polled the Society of Surgical Chairs a couple of years ago for anecdotes uh, about uh, did they have a aging surgeon uh, encounters, good or bad, and this was from one of them. I personally had to ask the former chair of surgery, 15 years my senior, to step down with dignity today or face a credentialing committee for wrong side surgery. I had heard that he needed a seeing eye resident, and there were multiple grumblings, but nothing documented or formal. I sat down with him with senior faculty. I'd like to say that it went well, but expletive, it was awful. He was hurt, pissed, resentful, and angry, stormed out, even refused a retirement party. I clearly was late to the game from the institutional risk perspective, but I never had any hard evidence or data upon which to base this. And there's plenty of evidence that surgeons and doctors in general uh, lack self-awareness as these studies, 359 surgeons over six years, uh, self-perceived cognitive change was not related to objective measures of cognitive function. Uh, 995 surgeons, most reported no perceived cognitive changes with age, and there was a review paper in JAMA about doctors in general that concluded the preponderance of evidence suggests that physicians have a limited ability to self-assess. How large a potential issue is this? Well, there's a category of the American College of Surgeons called senior fellows. You don't have to pay dues. You have to be over 70 and still practicing. There are nearly 6,000 in that category. And we know that only a fraction of American surgeons are actually fellows of the American College. And so there could be as many as 20,000 surgeons over the age of 70 still practicing in the United States. And it's beginning to hit the national press. You'll see headlines now and then about this. Fortunately, it hasn't caused a, a major problem. Uh, but the issue is beginning to reach the public uh, level. Now, we all know that human faculties deteriorate with increasing age. This is it's inevitable. Uh, it's no surprise. Here's running speed in men and women by age various uh, types of physiologic functions, uh, VO2 max, glomerular filtration rate, uh, FEV1, almost everything goes down with age. Here's cognition. Now, doctors 
start out a little bit higher than others, but uh, nevertheless decrease in almost the same rate. Higher education levels, higher socioeconomic levels actually start out a little bit higher, but there nevertheless is the progressive deterioration in cognitive function with age. This slide is one of the two most important slides of my talk. Variability among individuals actually increases with increasing age. And I'll come back to that more in just a moment. So, should there be a mandatory retirement age for surgeons? That would solve this problem, uh, more or less solve it. Uh, mandatory retirement age was proposed by Bismarck many years ago. He proposed a mandatory retirement age of 70 in Germany. Of course, at that time, people weren't living until 40 or 50. And actually, in the United States, mandatory retirement ages are illegal based on this act. However, Congress has made exceptions for certain professions. We all hear about airline pilots having to retire. Uh, FBI agents is no surprise, I suppose. Uh, judges varies by state. Air traffic controllers at the relatively young age of 56 have to retire. Even park rangers and lighthouse workers have mandatory retirement ages. But many professions <laughs> have no retirement age. And in the United States, surgeons have no mandatory retirement age. Now, in other countries, there are mandatory retirement ages, but not every country. Uh, I've been called by the president of the Swiss Surgical Association. They're struggling with this issue. The president of the Royal College of Surgeons in England is now struggling with it. They used to have a mandatory retirement age in the National Health Service, and it was challenged legally, and so now they don't. Um, but again, chronologic age really should not be the marker of impairment. You know, we all know 80-year-olds who can play vigorous tennis, other 80-year-olds who can't walk to the mailbox. So what we really need is some objective test, an objective screening test, and then maybe even a more comprehensive objective test. And so when I polled the Society of Surgical Chairs again, there were many bad co comments about surgeons and some good comments about surgeons. Uh, fell asleep taking down the internal mammary artery, had to ask a resident how to get back to his office, became slovenly in appearance. On the other hand, there were good comments. Still excellent at age 73, continued to operate uh, nearly 80, and was still superb. So clearly, chronologic age should not be our marker. Now, the public believes that we police ourselves, but this really is uh, illusory. Initial certification to be a surgeon is difficult, but recertification really is relatively easy. You know, you submit a list of cases and take a computerized test. Ongoing professional practice evaluations are done in every hospital, but they're highly variable, and often even an underperforming surgeon falls into that gray zone of, of uh, sort of within normal limits. Malpractice system, uh, don't get me started, but neither was constructed nor capable of helping with this, and there's lots of evidence that uh, the malpractice system can't deal with this issue. And so it comes down to the scrutiny of peers, staff, and administrators, but many barriers to this exist. For example, the older surgeon are often the most respected. They're often the rainmakers of their group. They were often teachers or mentors of their peers and, and often their present chief of surgery. Medical staff bylaws often don't address this issue. Subtle cognitive or physical changes may be difficult to identify, and so, uh, and peers may actually assist their older colleagues, enabling them to hide their problems uh, because of respect. Now, we need to police ourselves better. If we don't, others will. I have this fear that some relative of a U.S. senator will have a bad result under the hands of an aging surgeon uh, and it'll be discovered that that surgeon has had a lot of problems that were never recognized or dealt with. That's all it will take before um, we'll have a mandatory retirement age. Uh, we're a profession, so we have a duty to report. It's ethically the right thing to do, of course. The Joint Commission mandates it. It says uh, these various provisions of the Joint Commission, medical staff must determine a practitioner's evidence of physical ability. Uh, documentation regarding an applicant's health status and his or her ability should be confirmed. Uh, many doctors actually have no personal physician or don't see them very often. Cognitive impairment itself may lead to a lack of personal insight. And commonly now what happens is there's some death or serious event. 
or commonly OR nurses come to a chief of surgery and say, you must do something about this. It's actually easier to continue operating in many states than it is to continue driving a car. And so what we need is some test that balances this, and this is my second important slide today. Uh, it balances liability risk and patient safety on one hand with the dignity of this committed practitioner and that practitioner's long experience, therefore their uh, resource to society. Giving Frank time to... So, uh, a couple years ago, uh, I sat down and built an aging surgeon program. And I'll talk about screening for, uh, for a moment. This is a little more than just for screening. This is for uh, potential problem people. So the goals of the program were to protect surgeons from arbitrary methods or unreliable methods of assessing competence or capacity, identify potentially treatable or reversible disorders, which, if treated, could restore function, aid a surgeon in decision when to retire, and then on the other side of the balance, protect patients from unsafe surgeons, protect surgeons and hospitals from liability risk. The idea would be to provide an objective report and rely on the hospital's existing structures to deal with the results of that report. And so I convened in my office a team of these people, neuropsychologists and PTOT people and ethicists and lawyers, and we spent about 12 months reviewing the literature and through an iterative process built our comprehensive two-day evaluation. And I'll go over this uh, in just a little bit more detail. So the client uh, sends a history, fills out a history form and sends any relevant x-rays ahead of time. Uh, check uh, comes into Baltimore by train or plane or drives or whatever. We get them a cheap room in our local hotel. They come in Monday morning at 8 o'clock, have a general physical exam, a general neurology exam, and then an hour and a half of uh, PTOT work, and uh, the physical and occupational evaluations test uh, spatial ability, visual spatial thing, coordination, uh, visual perception, some endurance work, some balance work. So they use these somewhat sophisticated but commonly available devices in our uh, PTOT rehab uh, department. This is a balance device I'll show you, and this is a, called a, a vision thing, just a big touch screen basically. And so in this test, uh, one must touch the dot, and the examiner can move the dot at faster rates, they can disappear at faster rates, they can be more peripheral, less peripheral, and the computer judges one's misses and one's uh, uh, speed with doing this test. And then there's uh, the, the next one of this is one can only touch a red dot if uh, he or she sees the white dot. And so this tests one's inhibition as well. I have a lot of inhibition. <laughs> and then there's this Crawford board, which does fine motor skills, where one puts pegs and little screws in this board and, and is uh, measured by how many uh, you know, he can get done in a given time. And these, these are all standard tests. Here's a balance beam thing where one moves a cursor with his body and you can move it through a maze or uh, to points on a clock, or you can just try to keep the cursor right in the middle of the screen. And you can do this uh, with your eyes open, or then they can actually put a mask on you and you try to do it with your eyes closed. And they can change the sensitivity of this diabolical balance uh, disc. <laughs> uh, and then one has a nice lunch and, uh, and then comes back for a whole afternoon of neuropsychology testing. And these are standard tests. There are about 20 some of them, and they uh, measure attention span and, and learning and memory and, and, and even emotional status and frustration level. And I'm not allowed to show too many of these, but I'll show just a couple quick examples. And you know, some of you have seen these things. You know, if you, if you put, punch a hole in the, uh, in the folded paper at the top, what's it look like? If you look at the, uh, on the lower left, if you look at that figure from a different perspective, which one is it? Uh, you know, tests such as these. And this is one of the, the simpler ones, it's just connecting numbers, uh, but, but uh, we're measured on uh, how accurate this is and how fast one can do it. And again, I'm only allowed to show the simpler tests. 
because apparently one can practice for some of these. This is a touching blocks thing, so the examiner touches two blocks and then the uh, client has to reproduce what she does, and then she'll do three, and then she'll do four. It's not as easy when she gets up to seven, and, and then you have to do it in reverse. She'll, she'll, she'll do one, two, three, four, and you have to do, do them in reverse, and when that gets up to five, six, or seven, that's not so easy either. But there are norms for these things. So uh, then the, uh, they have dinner, or rather go, go back to the hotel, have dinner on their own, come back for a second day of punishment, and uh, no more neuropsychology in the morning, another nice lunch, then more PTOT, a uh, general eye exam in the afternoon, and then they leave, and we provide an objective report to whoever uh, contracted for the evaluation. And the report could say something like, uh, it's recommended that the physician's primary care provider review his medications, or the ability to manipulate small parts requires more time than expected, uh, Dr. X's ability to perform visually related tasks was impacted significantly when attention was divided. This created a high error rate during testing and is of significant concern for a surgeon. Now, we don't do people with known substance abuse or known psychiatric illness. The triggers for such an evaluation, well, one could be uh, just, uh, as a routine, say every surgeon over age 70 or 75 uh, uh, when they come up for recredentialing, I would suggest that our test is too, too much for that, is imp impractical for that. Um, a number of hospitals have developed policies around screening the older uh, practitioner. Um, I have a policy at Sinai that was just passed by our credentials committee that I'm going to take to our medical executive committee. I'm willing to share that with anybody. Email me if you like. But it includes three things. General, at, at age 75, and at each two-year recredentialing, a general physical exam, a general eye exam, and a, neurocog a visit to a neuropsychologist for a cognitive screening uh, for an hour or two. And the hospital will pay for anything not covered by insurance. Uh, and that's any practitioner, PAs, nurse practitioners, CRNAs, uh, and all doctors. Uh, but, and I can talk to others uh, at lunch if you have more interest in that. So our evaluation is not a screening evaluation. It's for identified problems. So uh, that could be a failure of an OPPE or an FPPE, a sentinel event, a worrisome malpractice history, or just the discretion of the chief of surgery or a hospital president who's heard from nurses in the OR or nurses on the floor uh, that there was an issue. Stanford had a late career practitioner policy. They were one of the first a few years ago. Uh, they had a, a peer review, a comprehensive physical, and a cognitive screening. They uh, since uh, withdrawn the cognitive screening because it was so controversial. But other hospitals around the country, Cooper in New Jersey, Camden, New Jersey, Children's Hospital in Arkansas, and again, Sinai Hospital, pretty much have the same things, and that is a general physical, a general eye exam, and some type of cognitive screening above a certain age. And so what, what could a hospital then do with the information? Well, they could continue full privileges, of course, if it's a good evaluation. No privileges, no operating privileges, maybe assisted by another surgeon, either for all cases or complex cases, maybe assistant privileges only or a focused review of a certain number of cases, decreased work hours, such as taking the physician off the call schedule. There's a whole menu of possibilities that a hospital could do if the, uh, based upon the report. Uh, looking at it from the other direction, a surgeon could conceivably use this evaluation to show that uh, he or she is still capable of operating. This was a surgeon in York, Pennsylvania, who sued WellSpan Health for age discrimination. And so in summary, we know that human faculties diminish with, in, uh, with increased age, it's a fact of life, but there's great variability with chronologic age. So functional age is not the same as chronologic age. There should be no mandatory retirement age, but there really should be some objective test of our function. All present methods of doing that are inadequate. And so that's why we developed our aging surgeon program. It's also why I would suggest that you work with your hospital to develop some type of, of screening for late career practitioners, whether that be seven, age 70, 75, you know, pick, it, pick an age. Osler said this more um, colorfully than, than I can. There is no sadder picture than the professor who has outgrown his usefulness 
and the only one unconscious of the fact insists with a praiseworthy zeal upon the performance of duties for which the circumstances of the time have rendered him unfit. Again, we need to balance that patient safety and liability risk on the one hand with the dignity of this committed, experienced practitioner and that practitioner's resource to society. If you have any further interest in this, just type aging surgeon into any search engine and you can read about more about our program or I published a paper in the Annals of Surgery a year and a half ago about this. Uh, or you can certainly contact me. Uh, my model, my hand model for my title slide was my emeritus chief of surgery, Dr. Gershon Efron, uh, who stopped operating in his 70s, but continues to be a, a force at our hospital. He's in the back of the room, the curmudgeon at M&M &M, uh, every week, and uh, uh, still teaches anatomy, has professor rounds for the medical students, and uh, remains a respected member of our group. Uh, taking a page from Dr. Efron's book and from Chris's lecture uh, just before this, uh, I'm actually thinking about my own uh, trajectory. I'm, I'll be 65 this year, and uh, in addition to the fact that uh, our system is growing, I'm thinking about my future too, and I'm about to initiate a research, uh, search for a new thoracic surgeon, so if anybody wants to move to Baltimore, contact me. Uh, there's that, this line that I've used a couple times this weekend already, uh, you want to leave the stage while they're still clapping. <laughs>